Those people who support re-implementing the death penalty in Canada argue that as long as there's a really stringent, effective appeal process in place, then worries about wrongful convictions leading to wrongful executions should be alleviated. Um, and even though it might seem like an unfeeling one when discussing a per person's life, something to take into account is cost. On one hand, supporters of capital punishment commonly, generally feel that in certain cases such as murder, that are obviously violent, the cost of maintaining the convicted person for years or decades to come is not reasonable and certainly shouldn't be put on everyday ordinary citizens. They feel that for certain crimes, you should simply be put to death instead of costing taxpayers thousands of dollars every year to keep you alive. What is the point if somebody's spending the rest of their life in prison? Is this a very unemotional, analytical way of explaining this perspective? Yes, but that is the basic argument. Partly an argument based on cost, and partly an argument based on the idea of an eye for an eye perspective. If you take somebody else's life, then we're going to take yours. Whereas capital punishment would provide a solution to putting this financial burden on us as taxpayers by eliminating the person who would never leave prison anyways. This perspective also eliminates concern about the recidivism rate, the proportion of convicted offenders who commit another crime, thus keeping society as a whole and all of us as individuals safer. But implementing this argument of maintaining a stringent and effective appeal process has demonstrated in those places that do maintain the death penalty, such as various states south, uh, south of the border, that when somebody is eventually put to death after 10 or 12 or 15 years or more after being initially found guilty, they've exhausted their, their appeals, that there's really no cost savings at all. So it is necessary to have an, exa an exhaustive appeal process in place to make sure a person who is innocent will be able to prove their innocence during appeals. But having it in place then negates the argument that implementing the death penalty results in saving tax dollars caring for a person that will never be outside of prison walls anyways. And again, I realize this may be harsh, but if allowed to speak without having to worry about being politically correct, this is one of the main arguments supporting capital punishment. And I looked high and low to try to find a visual for uh, the recidivism of Canadians and could not find it, which is why I have an example here of um, the United States. Um, Yes, and so this compares the national average of incidents per 100,000 population. So this is simply the crime rate in Canada, not the recidivism rate. Now, how does Canada feel about capital punishment now? It's difficult to get really accurate research regarding how the majority of Canadians feel about re-implementing capital punishment. If you look online, Popular polls kind of guesstimate that about 60% of Canadians are in favour of it being reinstated. But it's not an issue that's been officially studied. And remember, you've got to not just take a number or a statistic or research at face value. You've got to really look at how the research was conducted. And we simply don't have any really solid, valid, reliable research regarding how Canadians now feel about capital punishment. Um, maybe this is my naive way of looking at it and always wanting to approach things in the simplest way possible. But I think the next time we have a federal election, there should simply be an extra question added. Who do you want to vote for? And apart from that, by the way, do you agree with capital punishment or not? But I don't think this is going to happen. And again, I want you to think about this. I want to pose the question. Is the death penalty an effective deterrent? A lot of the U.S. has it, and their homicide rate is higher than Canada's. So just looking at that, it would suggest that it's not as effective as we might think. But in just looking at that, um, the U.S. also has an entire culture of gun ownership. And as simple as it sounds, a lot more guns. Con 
a lower rate of gun ownership have lower homicide rates. So then you have to take that into account as well. Capital punishment is often put forth as one of the only effective ways of inciting fear. That's true. And I'm going to refer to an American case as an example, a very well-known American case, and that involves Ted Bundy. He was a rapist, a serial killer, um, a burglar, a necrophile, meaning he would do things with bodies once they were dead. He confessed to 30 murders, although it is widely believed that the number of women he killed is actually much, much, much higher. Not just a few higher, but a lot higher. And it wasn't until shortly before he was executed that all appeals were exhausted that he actually confessed. Um, he exhausted every single legal point he and his lawyers could think of, all in an attempt to spare him execution. He took whatever legal steps he could to have his death, death sentence commuted to life without parole because the one thing he feared was being put to death. He would have strongly preferred to stay alive, even if it meant he would never, ever leave prison. Um, and he was a former law student. He was very personable. He was a really a people person. I don't mean that sarcastically. He was one of these people who was easily likable. He wasn't unattractive, um, which lent to enabling him to kill as many women as he did. So it was only towards the end when the appeal process failed him that he kind of came clean, so to speak, and told police where the bodies of unfound victims were so that their families could have closure. And it's widely believed he only did this, thinking that it would then lend public support executing him. He didn't want to be put to death. He did everything he could to avoid it. But he didn't fear life in prison. And it's not uncommon for avoidance of the death penalty to be a prime goal of a criminal during sentencing, because for most people, that is the worst punishment possible. So this is only a small selection of um, some of Bundy's victims. And if you're interested in him, there's quite a bit that's been written about him. There's been movies made about him, documentaries. Just type in his name online and you can get the full story. So... Is this actually a deterrent to committing crime that is effective or simply a reaction once a person is caught? Knowing the death penalty could be the possible out outcome before a crime is committed doesn't really seem to have as much effect as supporters of it seem to think. It doesn't really seem to keep a person from committing certain crimes. And I know... I'm not trying to convince you one way or another. I'm trying to encourage you to think about it from all sides. I also want to point out that it's easy to have this polite, calm, academic discussion about this when you're not personally involved. What if it was one of your loved ones who was murdered? What if it was one of your loved ones who was murdered by somebody who had been previously convicted of murder, who served their sentence, and then when they, released, when they were released, did the same thing to your family member. If somebody has been executed, they cannot harm anybody else. Simple as that. But is that enough to justify execution? That's the question. And, you know, if there's kind of like a sliding scale or a spectrum of possible approaches to punishment, on one end of the scale is capital punishment, and on the other end is restorative justice. This is a relatively recent perspective, a relatively recent approach that focuses on rehabilitating an offender through reconciliation with victims and the larger community. It does not focus on punishment. A restorative justice approach does not take a black and white either or approach to a crime. Instead, it focuses on each crime as an individual occurrence. It kind of personalizes the crime. So it takes into account all relevant circumstances, how it has affected the victim, how it has affected the wider community, what the perpetrator might do to provide restitution for the victim. Sometimes that involves financial restitution, sometimes it doesn't. Essentially, the perpetrator tries to, in some way, repair the harm that they've done 
So again, the focus is on restoration, not punish, not punishment. It's not focused on deterrence. It's not focused on retribution. It means then that the victims take an active role in the process. So they would agree to meet with the offender to describe how the crime has impacted them in order to help the offender realize and appreciate the effect that they've had. Now, the offender still has to be responsible for what they've done. They have to admit guilt as the first step and take responsibility for their actions. And restorative justice is generally employed for minor offenses, shoplifting, destruction of property, minor theft. It tries to purposely foster a dialogue between the offender and the victim or the offender and a community so that the victim feels they have been heard and the offender is made directly accountable for what they've done. Now, even though this is only used in minor offenses, the same kind of approach is sometimes used in theory with people who are imprisoned for serious offenses, sometimes even murdered, not as an alternative form of justice, but to help victims feel that they've been heard and recognized by the offender, that the effect of the crime is recognized and to provide closure for the victims. So a supervised meeting might be arranged, for example, if, if the offender is willing, between the event offender and the victim or the victim's families. Now, for minor crimes, it's believed that a restorative justice approach helps an offender to avoid future offenses. It helps to reduce the recidivism rate because it encourages them to be personally accountable, in part by being faced with being directly accountable for their actions. So, as I said, restorative justice is a completely, completely different approach um, to punishment and responsibility than capital punishment. Let's bring this all together. We've been talking about deviance and crime, what deviance actually is, and of course, what a crime is. I began the week talking about informal punishment, talked quite a bit about stigma. Um, and I really liked the textbook distinguishes between harm and perceived harm. Because sometimes there really is no harm done, it's just a difference. Then I looked at measuring crime. Victimless crimes, which is kind of a, a, a misnomer, a difficult term, because victimless doesn't mean there's no victim, it means that no victim has been identified. Uh, we looked at self-report surveys and that National Victimization Survey, which was very detailed, which is an example of very good, solid, reliable research. But at the same time, crime statistics can be inaccurate, not because of the research method, but because of um, how they are collected. If a police department decides to focus on one thing, then those statistics will be higher. Looked a little bit at gender and age and race, which involves racial profiling. Then we tried to explain what this is all about. So symbolic interaction approach. People learn to be, de to be deviant. Symbolic interaction is all about socialization. So kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy, being labeled deviant might lead a person to engage in deviant behavior. And functionalism, going all the way back to Durkheim and how rule breaking increases solidarity because people react to rule breaking or deviance or crime by coming together. And Merton's strain theory, the gap between this American dream that everybody is supposed to have and be able to achieve, even though the means to do so are really, truly not available to everybody. Conflict theory, how would that explain deviance and crime? We looked at Spitzer and how he presented this as a challenge to private property ownership, um, socioeconomic status, and how that affects your experience with justice. Remember, I used O.J. Simpson as an example. And then Hershey and his control theory. And finally, feminism looking at deviance and crime that women, historically speaking, have been powerless. And there's a lot of debate over whether how much that has been alleviated. Medicalization of deviance. Really, really interesting. Um, you can take entire courses on just this one topic, the medicalization of deviance. Taking a problem that is not typically considered a medical problem, but making it a medical issue. 
prison, what is the point other than punishment, you know, um, a consequence? What exactly is the point of prison? What does it accomplish? What do we want it to accomplish? And are we really in some ways in the grip of panic when you have people who just say, we need more punishment, we need more punishment, build more prisons? Capital punishment and the death penalty, pros and cons, can be a very heated debate, brings in a lot of different issues. Um, easy to talk about when you feel like you're not directly affected. Uh, often people who have been directly affected take a much different perspective. Brings in issues of what it accomplishes, what we think it accomplishes, what it actually gets done. Capital punishment and the debate around that can be a very heated debate. And at the opposite end of the spectrum from that is restorative justice. So this has been your lecture on deviance and crime. Uh, remember that you have a quiz to do for this week. Um, Make sure that you get that done. Don't just leave all the quizzes to the end. Make sure that when you sit down to do it, you have time and you won't be interrupted because you cannot attempt a quiz twice.